and we're about to begin. So if I can just ask everybody to please take their seats and we will get underway in just a moment. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to all of you to the 2017 Bioeconomy Investment Summit. And a very, very warm welcome to all of you out there who are joining us on YouTube. This has been streamed live, so obviously no Chatham House rule today. So anything you're going to say, make sure you're, uh, you're happy that it's on the record. So wonderful that you're all here today. My name is Etna Trainer, and I'm going to be the Master of Ceremonies for today. Now, of course, it's a very exciting time of year to be talking about forestry. And particularly, I think, in recent days, where we've all got a feel for that wonderful winter wonderland that we have here in Finland. The opportunities for the bioeconomy are endless and come at a very, very urgent and indeed a timely juncture in the development and growth of the world. Let's take a look at world economic growth for 2017. And it's really been supported by very strong momentum in all of the major economies around the world and indeed in all the growing sectors as well. Growth is now standing at about 3.7%. And that healthy momentum is said to continue right through 2018. Now, when we look at fossil fuel, and we do look at fossil fuel quite a lot, and quite honestly, we're probably very dependent on it at the moment, but things are changing. Global oil demand last year was more than 95 million barrels a day, and projections for 2022 will be that it will be more than 102 million barrels a day. That's a lot of oil, and that's a lot of energy demand. World population is on the increase, consumers have more disposable income, and they demand, and rightly so, a better lifestyle. Continued industrialization, construction, and transportation are driving energy demand. But the key players in the oil and gas sector know that they are in a transitional space as fossil fuel demand is being substituted by greener alternative energy sources. This is a huge opportunity for the bioeconomy to shine and to really come into its own. Now, in the next eight hours, we have a very informative, absolutely packed agenda for all of you. And we really encourage your full participation. The purpose of this summit is really to engage, I would say, to inform, to educate you, and also to hopefully inspire you as to the future of the bioeconomy. We will examine the new paradigm for a new era of energy demand. We're going to look at Europe's needs in terms of the bioeconomy and how perhaps it can become a global leader in this space. We'll also examine the investment opportunities and take a look at the shift in demand for materials and products, as well as chemicals and biorefined products. Now, the richness of the dialogue will be enhanced by the experience of many of the entrepreneurs who have been leading the way in this sector for many years. It will also be re-energized, I would say, by the pace of change in the industry and by the encouragement of institutions like the EFI as it champions a path ahead to make our world a greener, more sustainable and more permanent wonderland for generations to come. Now, first, I want to introduce you to a leading proponent of the bioeconomy here in the region and indeed spreading that influence around the world. He spent much of his life in politics and much more of his life, as he would like to say, as a farmer. He served as the Prime Minister of Sweden from 1996 to 2006 and led the Swedish Social Democratic Party until 2007. He's currently a consultant for the Stockholm-based public relations firm JKL, and he's also the president of the European High-Level Forum on the Future of Forests, Think Forest, facilitated by the European Forest Institute. I'd like you now to give a very, very warm welcome to Goran Peterson.
Thank you, Etienne. And good morning. Welcome to this summit. It's an important summit in um, a very decisive time because we need to take action around the world to combat climate change. And um, if you look around, you can see many who want to contribute to that uh, task, but you don't see so much of political leadership. While we are sitting here today, we have just witnessed the discussions in relation to the Paris Agreement. The institutions that we need to go ahead are under severe pressure. The Paris summit is an illustration of that. Bioeconomy is for us in the Nordic countries mainly linked to forestry activities. Forests have given us our wealth and our success. Not the forests themselves only, but in combination with the traditional forest industry. Sawmills, paper and pulp, have built our countries strong and rich. That is also, or perhaps most, the case in Finland. And to gather here in Finland, this time in the year, shortly after the celebration of this young nation's 100th anniversary, is something that is completely natural because Finland has taken the lead in the bioeconomy discussion internationally. This young nation, successful nation, one of the richest in the world, having started after the Second World War with the Civil War and the, the, the First World War, the Civil War and the Second World War, and nevertheless, becoming one of the richest and most successful countries in the world. Production and a fair distribution. We admire what Finland have done, and we are with confidence looking forward to what Finland will deliver in the future. Our heartfelt congratulations to your 100th anniversary. What we will witness this summit is a close cooperation between science and industry. I have learned one thing from politics, and that is the difficult thing is not to realize what to do. The difficult thing is to do it, to deliver. And we have talked so much about bioeconomy. Now it's time to deliver. It's time to take the next leap forward. And that must be done in a close cooperation between science and industry. I am glad to say that this summit is a result of the initiatives from the European Forest Institute at the university in UNSU a European institution. And we have also, in front of this conference summit, had a published report from the Hetemäki group describing popular how we can look upon bioeconomy and the future. That also underline why we meet in Finland. So therefore, my dear friends, I'm looking forward to discussions. I'm looking forward to interventions starting 
from a business perspective or a scientific perspective. And I can assure you, what the political landscape need is partners of that kind, because we are just now lacking initiatives to go forward. Come into this close cooperation, not only for Finland, but for the future, for the climate, for the globe. Welcome to the summit. I have the honor to give the floor to the Finnish Minister of Economic Affairs, Mikka Lintele, please. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Distinguished chair, dear colleagues, friends, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today with you and share my thoughts on Finnish bioeconomy. Companies, governments and individual consumers have woken up to the challenges caused by climate change and waning natural resources. At the global level, we will have less to share in terms of food, energy and fresh water resources in the future. We are on the edge of the new economic era of sustainable bio-based economy. In 2014, the Finnish government published the National Bioeconomy Strategy based on a major mobilization of stakeholders representing the bioeconomy. They were consulted in five workshops, three regional bioeconomy forum, forums, and sectoral consultation. All those interested in the topics were also invited to express their views. The strategic goals of the bioeconomy strategy are, first, the competitive operating environment for the bioeconomy. Second, new business from the bioeconomy. Third, a strong bioeconomy competence base. And fourth, accessibility and sustainability of biomasses. The strategy has set the objective to push the bioeconomy output to 100 million euro by 2025 and to create 100,000 new jobs. To implement these objectives, we have ident identified in our governmental program five strategic priorities, one of them being the bioeconomy and clean solutions. These strategies priorities are supported by the establishment of key projects and allocation of funding to them. Bioeconomy is a great opportunity for the country like Finland with large forest resources and a strong forest sector. About half of the Finnish bioeconomy is forest-based. The Finnish forest sector has strong know-how in forestry, forest industries and technology, but also in sectors such as chemistry, food and health sciences. Well-established cooperation on, and combined technologies in these fields make Finland in the real forerunner in the bioeconomy. Our forest sector will have central part of the implementation of bioeconomy strategy. Main objective is to increase the use of wood and innovative wood-based products. These products include various kinds of transport fuels, bio oil and biogas dissolving pulp, microfibrillated, 
cellulose, wood composites, and construction materials. But we all, but we should not forget that the role of the traditional forest industry is crucial because it forms a solid platform for the development of new innovative bioproducts. The use of natural resources in, in a sustainable way, economy, economically, environmentally, and socially, is the fundamental principle. Finland is well known for growing forest resources that are managed in a sustainable manner and that are mainly certified. The, to support the bioeconomy, is, it is important that wood raw material is available for the market, as the annual growth of forest in Finland is much greater than the volume of trees that are annually harvested. Different types of economic actors have become interested in the business opportunities, opportunities that are embodied in Finnish bioeconomy. Forest industry invest, investments have started to grow total value of an ongoing and planned project is estimated to be over 3 billion euros. For instance, Metsa Group just finished constructions of a large bioproduct factory in Äänekoski, central Finland. In addition to high quality pulp, the mill intends to produce bioenergy and various biomaterials. The mill site already hosts several other wood processing companies and the number is set to increase. The right financing mechanisms are needed to base researches for the innovations and commercialization of new products. At the European level, the Horizon 2020 program should continue to promote resource and innovation on bioeconomy, as well as the related business models and the pilot projects. With these words, I would like to thank you for the possibility to take part in the opening of 2017 Bioeconomy Invest Summit. Thank you. Minister Lintilla, thank you so much for your opening remarks and indeed for setting the scene again on the tremendous importance and the opportunities for the bioeconomy. Let's get right down to business now and let's get started on our first panel. A new paradigm for a new era. I will call our panelists up and then I will welcome our chairman back to the stage. So if we can please have um, from the Australian National University, Robert Cons uh, Costanza. Robert, if you can sit here, please. From Systemic, the founder and managing director joins us, Martin Stuktai. Martin, if you can join us. I will now leave an empty space, gentlemen, if we may, for our chairman. So, uh, Marcus, if you can join the next one, the chairman of Skandinaviska and Skilda Banken, SEB, Marcus Wallenberg. So, the chairman, if he can... on this side here. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to have with us the former Prime Minister of Finland, Mr. Esko Aho. So great to have you here as well. And now I want to leave you in the very capable hands of the dear Chairman for this session. Once again, a very warm welcome for Joran Persson. Okay, I don't need to do a new presentation. We start directly. I ask Professor Robert Constanza to take the floor, please. Can I have the first slide? 
Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I think I'll be a little provocative for this audience uh, to talk about the need for a new economic paradigm, uh, the way we think about the economy, what the economy is for, and, uh, and how it fits in with the rest of our, uh, our, our natural system as the basis for a sustainable, and I added one word to my title, uh, sustainable and desirable future. Uh, we don't want a future that's uh, sustainable but not desirable. We want a future that's, uh, we don't want a future that's desirable but not sustainable. So it's really a question of combining those two. Uh, the definition of sustainability I don't think is that difficult. We want something that lasts. But the, the real problem is what do we want to last? Uh, what feature, what do we want the world to look like uh, going forward? Um, we live in a whole new geologic epoch. Um, you may have heard this term, the Anthropocene, uh, because of the magnitude of the human presence um, in the biosphere. We don't live in an empty world any longer. We live in a, a full world, full of humans and their artifacts. It's having major impacts on our ecological life support system. So we, can't, we have to start taking these interconnections much more seriously. We can't think of the economy in isolation uh, from, from the rest of the world. I think this means that business as usual is not really an option. You know, as Paul Raskin has said, business as usual is really the utopian fantasy. Uh, we need practical alternatives. Uh, to create a sustainable and desirable Anthropocene, we have to think, act, finance, and I think govern uh, very differently. It's time for, for some significant uh, transformations in the world. To achieve this world of sustainable well-being, we have to integrate these three elements of having um, an adequate vision, um, not only of how the world is, our scientific understanding of the world, and this is certainly progressing quite rapidly as we learn more about how these complex interdependent uh, systems of humans and nature uh, function, as we learn more about human psychology, you know, what actually does contribute uh, to human well-being. And it's, it's much more than simply consumption of goods and services. But we also need to have an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be. What kind of world are we trying to create? As the great American uh, philosopher Yogi Berra once said, if, if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. So where are we going? I think there's significant progress in that regard, too, and I'll talk about the, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals a little bit as we go forward. Our tools and analytical techniques, I think, need to be consistent with that uh, changing vision, and, and there, I think, more of a systems view of the world is what's, is what's necessary, as, as do our implementation strategies, um, new institutions, new, new ways of managing and governing these systems, I think, are also important. Um, you've probably all seen some version um, of this paper uh, led by Johan Rockström from the Stockholm Resilience Center um, about the fact that there are fundamental ecological constraints. There are planetary boundaries. There is a safe operating space for humans in the biosphere. We're probably already exceeding that safe operating space in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen cycling, several other things are rapidly approaching uh, the safe space. This is normally the way we pose this issue. Uh, to the public, uh, that we're, we're doing the wrong thing, we have to stop doing it. Uh, you know, this is an inconvenient truth. That's not the movie that most people are lining up to go see, however. Uh, it's much easier uh, to believe in, in a reassuring lie, as, as some recent political events have, have shown us. Uh, but <clears throat> I think, in fact, uh, what's needed now is a third movie, uh, a new way, um, a new vision, and a new narrative uh, about uh, the kind of world that we really want to create, uh, and how does the economy fit into that world. Um, and it's going to requ require, I think, a change in vision of our place in the world. Uh, the economy uh, needs to be seen as embedded in society, embedded in the rest of nature, uh, the environment. These are not separate things. We can't manage the economy uh, out of the context uh, of society and, and the rest of nature. Um, so I think that's a significant difference. Um, <clears throat> you might call this a well-being economy. How do we actually manage the well-being uh, of both humans and the rest of life? Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of overlapping ideas. This has been called by several different names. Uh, you know, the circular bioeconomy, I think, fits into this, this range of, of ideas that, that really share a lot. Uh, the ecological economy, a regenerative economy. I just came back from a, a meeting in China where they're talking about an ecological civilization. Um, you might have heard the term the donut economy, a steady state economy. Um, I like the Swedish term lagom, you know, which means just enough, well distributed. Maybe we need a lagom economy. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, <clears throat> um, this idea of ecological economics as a different paradigm for how we, we deal with, uh, with, with the economy, I think, is one that I've been involved with for a long time. Um, and it's based on these three fundamental questions or goals. We need an ecologically sustainable scale or magnitude or size of the economy within uh, the rest of the, the world. So we have to stay within planetary boundaries. We need a socially fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation of humans, but also between the current and future generations and between humans and other species. And we need an economically efficient allocation of, of resources, but that allocation has to include all the resources that affect human well-being, including things that are not marketed, or natural capital, or social capital. Uh, so another way of looking at it is, yes, we need to stay within uh, the planetary boundaries, but we also need to pro provide the elements of human well-being and quality of life. We have a, a, a social floor and a biophysical ceiling, and we need to stay within uh, what some have called the, the donut. A, a, sub, a significant move in the right direction here, I think, is the, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which were recently agreed to by all countries, including Sweden and Finland, and the United States, and Australia. <laughs> um, and these goals, I think, are, uh, it's the first time in human history uh, that all countries in the world have agreed to a set of goals that are much broader uh, than simply uh, you know, increasing production of marketed goods and services. They include, as you see on this list, you know, reducing poverty and hunger and reducing uh, inequality. And, and uh, several of these are, are directly related to uh, the bioeconomy, to the, to the biosphere. Uh, clean water and sanitation, urgent action on climate change, number 13, you know, restoring uh, and preserving marine and terrestrial resources. Uh, so <clears throat> it's a significant step forward, I think, in terms of developing the shared goals for, for humanity, the shared vision of the kind of world that we really want. These goals um, are often seen in isolation from each other and, and are sort of siloed, but in fact, uh, they're very interdependent. There are lots of synergies and trade-offs between them. They all contribute to the overarching goal of having a, a sustainable and desirable future in various ways, in various countries. So I think it's a, a huge research agenda that's been put on the table. How do these goals contribute? Um, and how do we um, understand and manage um, well-being and a well-being economy? This is another way of looking at the goals <clears throat> that shows the embeddedness of the economy and society and the biosphere and which goals relate to each of those most directly. Uh, but again, they're all interdependent. Uh, they all uh, contribute in various ways. Um, natural capital uh, provides a significant contribution to, that, to, to human well-being uh, through what are called ecosystem services, the benefits that, that people derive from functioning ecosystems. Uh, just quickly, who here has heard the term ecosystem services before? All right, good, almost everyone. <laughs> We're getting that message out. Um, I'm always surprised at sometimes how, how few people have heard that term. But, <clears throat> uh, and, and of course, um, the bioeconomy is a significant contributor here. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, provisioning services in particular, uh, you know, of wood, um, et cetera, uh, <clears throat> are important contributors uh, from, nat from natural ecosystems. But it goes much further than that. Uh, there are non-marketed, uh, non-products, the, the services that these systems provide uh, in their intact state, uh, including climate regulation and flood regulation, you see the, the list there, and uh, cultural recreation amenities, um, to the various constituents of human well-being. <clears throat> um, there is one thing missing from this diagram, however. Um, and that is the interaction with the other major forms of capital assets uh, that are all required uh, to produce sustainable human well-being. Uh, the natural capital doesn't just flow into, into people's uh, well-being. Uh, it requires you know, built capital or, or conventional capital infrastructure, um, human capital, individual people uh, with their education, their health, uh, their individual well-being but significantly social capital, all of our communities, our, our networks, our interactions uh, between people. The market itself is a form of social capital. Uh, so we need all of these assets in the right combination uh, in, in, uh, and in a balanced way to produce sustainable well-being. I think this is the challenge going forward, is understanding these complex interactions, how they function over time, over space, uh, et cetera. It's inherently a transdisciplinary uh, activity that our universities are not well set up to, to deal with, uh, but one that, that really is 
probably the most important challenge that we have going forward if our goal is really to create this sustainable and desirable future. 20 years ago now, uh, we tried to assess the value of all of the ecosystem services in the world and, and natural capital <clears throat> um, and published this synthesis paper in, uh, in Nature uh, that came up with an estimate that was far larger than the, the total value of global uh, GDP. Um, <clears throat> One thing we didn't control was what they put on the cover of the magazine. They said pricing the planet. We didn't really mean pricing. We meant valuing in a more comprehensive way uh, because many of these resources are not private goods. Uh, they are um, uh, common assets. They're producing public, public goods, and therefore we need to really value them in that, in that perspective. What is their contribution to well-being relative to some of the other things that are, that are marketed? <clears throat> More recently, we tried to assess how these values have changed in the last, uh, in the time since 1997, um, based on new information and based largely on changes in land use, uh, from deforestation, particularly in the tropics, uh, from, from uh, loss of wetlands, desertification, et cetera. So land use change over that time period has resulted in a loss of about $20 trillion a year in the value of these ecosystem services. Um, <clears throat> a significant loss to, to human well-being. Uh, but these things have not been visible or as visible in the past. So what we're trying to do here is make them much more visible. Um, we also were, are looking at how these, how these um, uh, values might change going forward into the future. And this is based on um, a group of scenarios that was created by the Great Transition Initiative. Um, they have these four basic scenarios for the world that they've, they've uh, elaborated in some detail. Uh, including a market forces, kind of business as usual scenario, a policy reform scenario with, with much more government intervention, a great transition scenario, which I think is, is sort of the SDG world. If we, really, if we really achieved all of the SDGs, that's what the world might look like, and fortress world or sort of a collapse scenario. <clears throat> um, I think it's important going forward, if we really want uh, the public to understand the SDGs, it's not going to be enough to put a list of 17 goals, even though they're nicely colored and everything, um, <clears throat> out on the table. I think we have to show what that world uh, would look like. What would life be like uh, for people in, in these different scenarios? So I think there's, there's a major contribution that we need from the arts community, from the, the film community, uh, to try and elaborate <clears throat> you know, what, what would uh, the SDG world actually look like and how would that life uh, actually be better uh, than in some of the other scenarios. <clears throat> as far as ecosystem services are concerned, uh, we looked at uh, how they have, the val their values have changed from 1997 to 2011. Can I point at this? <clears throat> Under the fortress world or, or um, uh, <clears throat> a sort of business as usual scenario, we, we anticipate continued decline. Uh, we can stabilize that with a policy reform scenario, but there is the possibility uh, for a major restoration of those services and, and systems. Uh, to recover uh, the value of ecosystem services going forward um, out to the year 2050. Um, <clears throat> several countries are, are involved in doing something like this. As I said, I just came back from, from China where they've invested literally billions of dollars in restoring uh, natural ecosystems, uh, forests and, and wetlands, um, understanding some of these, these contributions. Um, this is what it looks like um, country by country in terms of the percentage change. You can see that, that in general, uh, the Great Transition Initiative leads to, to generally positive um, improvements in, in uh, ecosystem service values, uh, fortress world and market forces generally losses. Um, <clears throat> we pulled out uh, Finland and Sweden uh, just to show uh, the, the relationship to GDP and the total ecosystem service value, those first two columns, and then under each of the four scenarios and what the percentage change uh, might be. So there's, you're looking at a, the possibility for you know, massive um, negative changes or, or pretty massive positive changes, depending on how we manage uh, these ecosystems uh, going forward. <clears throat> there are some mistaken identities about ecosystem services and valuation I'd like to point out. First one being that economics is not the same thing as the market. The market is just one mechanism, one institution that, we've, that we use for allocating resources. But economics really should be much more than that. It's about all how we manage our our planet. Um, how, going back to the Greek root for the word, uh, economics is you know, from oikos, which means house, uh, and nomics is management. How do we manage our house overall, our, our larger house? 
Valuation is not about privatization or commodification or trading, necessarily. Uh, it's really about contributions to well-being, and expressing these values in monetary units is not the same as market or exchange values. Also, we can't avoid valuation. The decisions we make about ecosystems uh, imply valuations. What we're trying to do is make these valuations more explicit uh, to try to understand those underlying complexities, and they are complex. There's a range of uses for this valuation of ecosystem services and natural capital, including just raising awareness, but also modifying natural in national income and well-being accounts. We need to get beyond uh, the over-reliance on GDP and market measures uh, to, of well-being <clears throat> at the national level. Uh, specific policy analysis, urban and regional land use planning, uh, payment for ecosystem services. So uh, individual forest owners you know, can be paid for producing not only uh, forest products, but also some of the, the uh, non-marketed, currently non-marketed forest services that those, their forests produce. Full cost accounting, uh, we need to understand the implications of business activities, the external costs uh, of businesses, and there's been a lot of work um, on, on that. And also the idea of how do we manage these, these assets uh, as, as common assets rather than necessarily as private assets. Um, property rights regimes are important uh, because these systems have different characteristics. Uh, some of the goods and serv goods that they produce are rival and excludable and can be, um, in, uh, you, the market mechanism can be used quite, uh, quite adequately to manage them and allocate them. Uh, but others are, pr are public goods, uh, particularly regulatory and cultural services. So we need different kinds of institutions and the, and the right mix of, of institutions uh, to deal with uh, the, the characteristics of these <clears throat> natural ecosystems. Um, one example has to do with climate change and, and the atmosphere. So we could uh, think of the atmosphere more as a common asset. Um, under the public trust doctrine, uh, governments have the responsibility uh, to pre protect these common assets. Uh, currently, the atmosphere is an open access resource, but we can say that it, it actually belongs to all of us. Uh, so once we've established that and created a, a trust uh, over the atmosphere, we could begin to charge uh, those that damage that trust and, and, uh, and reward those that, that improve it. Uh, so we could, uh, we could pay forest owners for uh, sequestering carbon, for example, but also uh, charge oil companies for in introducing carbon into the atmosphere. <clears throat> I think an important um, consideration here going forward, too, is, is how do we um, <clears throat> get a better uh, public-private partnerships uh, for investing in natural capital? Natural capital assets produce, um, as I said, a range of different goods and services. Some are marketed um, and some are not marketed and, and have a public return as opposed to a private return. Uh, <clears throat> so that getting the, the investment in those assets uh, to be balanced uh, in a way that reflects uh, where those returns are going, I think is a, is a challenge going forward. And there are uh, some, some initiatives along those lines. Uh, but it's gonna take better understanding of what the returns are and how these complex systems function. Um, I think that's evolving uh, fairly quickly, but I think as far as the bioeconomy is concerned, uh, this is going to be a key, a key asset. Uh, if you invest in forests, it's not only uh, for the private return for the, the, the products coming out of the forest. It's really also uh, for the services that are currently non-marketed. And how do you get that balance uh, to be right, uh, to, to maximize uh, the, the total societal good, uh, to maximize sustainable uh, human well-being? <clears throat> um, there have been uh, some, uh, some interesting um, individuals contributing to, to, uh, to, to some of these ideas. Uh, Pope Francis in his latest encyclical uh, is very clear uh, that uh, we need the economic and social costs of using up these environmental resources to be recognized with full transparency if we expect uh, this to be an ethical situation. Um, as I said, the president of, of China recently uh, in, the, in their latest party Congress is calling for the creation of an ecological civilization, uh, one that takes on board some of these ideas. A good ecological environment's the most universal common good, the most universal aspect of people's well-beings. Uh, this is Ken Henry, the former treasurer of Australia. He's now the chair of the National, I mean the um, <clears throat> NAB, the National Australia Bank, and uh, <clears throat> uh, he's he's come out with a speech recently about the importance of natural capital, um, not only to to businesses, uh, but but also to the country as a whole. It's not a footnote to a business plan, it's a core asset on the balance sheet. We've been working with, with NAB 
uh, to develop ways to measure uh, natural capital in, in farming systems uh, in order that they can use that information uh, to allocate um, who to loan to and how much at, at what interest rate. And that sort of feedback and incentive, I think, can really uh, change farmers' behavior. Uh, and it's based on the fact that uh, farmers who do better managing their natural capital are more resilient, uh, especially in the long term, and have better long-term returns, even if they, if they don't in the short term. So um, <clears throat> one problem is that we rely too much on, uh, on GDP as a measure of progress. And as you probably know, GDP was never designed as a measure of societal well-being. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it counts everything as positive. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they're, they're, it's well past time, as, as, as many have, have argued, uh, to develop alternative uh, indicators. We know, for example, that if you look at uh, life satisfaction <clears throat> measured on the, on the y-axis there versus GDP per capita, uh, you get <clears throat> you know, increases at first, uh, but after a certain point, uh, it really levels off. And increasing GDP per capita is not really increasing, improving people's subjective well-being. Um, when you ask them that, that question. So um, do we really need you know, increasing uh, consumption at this stage in some countries? Uh, really, we have to look at what contributes to bro a broader sense of well-being and get beyond that. There are several alternatives that have been suggested uh, to, GD <clears throat> to GDP, um, including uh, a few that modify GDP. I'll talk about one in a second. Uh, some that are direct measures of subjective well-being, ask asking people in surveys. And some are a range of indicators that are put together. The OECD Better Life Index, for example, is one that, that you should take a, uh, take a look at. Uh, that includes a whole range of different, uh, different factors. <clears throat> um, this is the, uh, the World Happiness, from the World Happiness Report. This is the ranking of happiness by country. Um, and I put this up uh, partly to show that Scandinavia does really well in this, in this regard. So the top... 10 countries, of the top 10 countries, there are five of them are Scandinavian so countries. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Finland does better than Sweden, I think, yes, <laughs> in this regard. So I don't know how that happened. <clears throat> New Zealand and Australia also not, not doing too badly. But what's interesting here is that they also looked at the, com the per percentage or the, com the, the part of that um, uh, happiness uh, or subjective well-being that's explained by these different factors. The explained by GDP is just the blue bar there. Uh, so uh, some fraction, but not, certainly not a large fraction is explained by GDP per capita. A lot more is explained by social capital, by, by natural capital, by other things that are, that are not, not in there. So better explaining what actually does contribute to people's sense of well-being and happiness and, and the sustainability of that, I think, is, is one of our challenges going forward. Um, another indicator is something called the Genuine Progress Indicator, <laughs> and it starts with personal consumption, uh, expenditures, a major component of GDP, but then it weights those by the distribution of that income. Uh, since we know that uh, income distribution is a, and inequality is a major, as, is a major factor in, uh, in societal well-being. And then it adds a few things that are left out, like the value of household labor and the value of volunteer work and subtracts a bunch of things that we really don't want to count as positives. Uh, you know, we don't want more crime or more uh, family breakdown or the more air and water pollution. So it's got 26 different elements. This uh, indicator has been estimated for 17 different countries around the world. You can see that in, in general there's a pattern of increasing up to a point and then uh, a sort of leveling off as these negative factors begin to overcome the positive factors. We estimated this globally, um, and you can see that um, GDP per capita, the green line on the top, continues to increase, where GPI followed it for a while until about 1980 or so, and then has leveled off and actually started to decline. So we're in a period of what Herman Daly has called uneconomic growth. The economy is still growing. It's not really economic because the negative side effects of that growth are beginning to outweigh the, 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 positive, the positive benefits. We can turn that around. Um, I think once we're aware of what those negative side effects are, and largely they have to do with the loss of natural capital and growing uh, inequality. Um, but the economy is changing quite rapidly for other reasons as well. You know, the sharing economy, there's a lot of things that are not picked up uh, adequately in, in GDP. So I think we need a major revision in how we measure progress um, in, our, in our societies. This one is certainly not the perfect indicator. Um, it's got a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, but we certainly need uh, better work. <clears throat> so to create this, 
sustainable and desirable economy and society in the rest of nature, I think, requires that we break our addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm. Uh, we need to refocus on the kind of world that we really want, um, the, the, GD, the SDG world where, where um, <clears throat> uh, we're focused really on well-being. One recent uh, development in that, that regard is the creation of this well-being economy alliance. Uh, something instead of the, the, uh, the G7, we might have the WE7. What are the economies that are focused on this broader definition of well-being? And there was a meeting in Scotland uh, last October that included uh, the finance minister from Sweden, uh, the first minister of Scotland, um, uh, representatives from Costa Rica, Slovenia, and New Zealand. And they're committed to creating this alliance and moving that, that forward. Uh, so, so maybe Finland would like to, to join this group as well. And finally, um, <clears throat> We need to, to change the way we frame these issues. Uh, this guy in the back is saying, yeah, what if it's all a big hoax and we create this better world for nothing? So <clears throat> we need to really focus on what this better world looks like. Uh, the SDG world, I think, is, is this set of characteristics. Um, how do we begin to communicate uh, that that world is much better uh, than <clears throat> where we seem to be headed? It's not only more desirable, it's also more sustainable. And I think that's where we want to go. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Constanza. And uh, we have the opportunity later for a question and answer session. Now I give the floor to Professor Martin Stutchtai from um, uh, Systemic. That is the founding manager and uh, also a partner. Please. Thank you, Chairman, Excellencies, um, Larry, Mark. Uh, thanks a lot for the warm welcome and the kind invitation. Um, it's nice to be back in Finland. Uh, this is not Finland. This is the forest around my house in Austria. Um, looking at a forest sends a warm signal to the heart particularly to the Finnish heart, Swedish heart, I guess. Uh, it also sends a message to our mind. Um, and that has changed over time. It used to be home in the very earliest days. Then it was the source of fuel, of food, unlimitedly so. Then it was the limited source of fuel and food. And increasingly we feel that we need to create a completely new vision of what the forest is, of what natural systems are. It's something that we have to reintegrate ourselves into. It's something where we have invest into recoupling, into regeneration and into reconciliation. I'll get there in a moment. Very often we have done that in the past that we had to change our vision of how we look at something, paradigm shift. Um, whose view has read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of a Scientific Revolution? It's still the best book, or it's still the best description what it feels like to, when we come to an inflection point. He sold 1.4 million copies of that, and increasingly so more recently, because we get it, that we are actually getting to an inflection point. And we can see it in social life, we can see it in scientific life, and we can see it in our econ economic life. Uh, I think that we have arrived at something that we call the Great Divergence. All the way to the 80s, all the major economic parameters were in fact evolving in sync. Um, and ever since, we have been building massive dynamic gaps, and two of those gaps are really getting very tangible now, even politically. The difference between labor productivity and mean family income, in fact, ha might have been um, crucial for some of the political landslides that we have seen over the last 18 months. And the red arrow is the difference between GDP per capita and every reasonable measure for human progress. And Robert has talked about it. In this case, GPI, Genuine Progress Indicator. So we need to understand this better. And in order to understand it better, we have to understand what is this growth engine about. And we can't talk about growth without celebrating it. Uh, we have grown our economy 45 times over the last century and at least three times in the last 20 years. We have brought a billion people out of poverty and every one of us today is mastering goods and services that even emperors only dreamt of 100 years ago. We need to celebrate that. But because it is so important to keep our, this growth, to keep our political promises, we need to understand what is driving it. And the economists amongst us, so we have all learned that uh, this is about capital accumulation and labor. 
uh, there's increasingly a school of thought that is telling us there's something missing. Robert Ice, for example, talks about exegy, uh, which is perhaps the new world that we need to learn as a first year economics student, which explains why the solo model, which we currently use to explain grow, uh, growth, is so wrong. It's only explaining 30% of growth. And exegy, that is the useful work that we get out of natural resources. And that sounds quite intuitive if you think about it, that much of the growth that we have seen over the last 150 years, in fact, has been due to this open-ended injection of natural resources into the system. And that's very important to understand because we want to grow because we don't. Uh, so we want to see more growth. And if we continue to heat up the economic engine, which essentially is still a combustion engine driven by natural resources, by ex uh, exergy, then we might, in fact, arrive at a point where Robert took us to a moment ago, where, in fact, we are growing ourselves poor. This is a new paradigm. That's not the rabbit anymore. That's the duck. Uh, that's when all of a sudden the side effect of growth uh, are getting uh, superior to the desired effect of growth. So if you measure it in the GDP term, we continue to grow. But if you really take growth as the accumulation of capital, and that's manufactured capital, financial capital, social capital, and natural capital, which is increasingly easy to measure, there's good science behind it now, then we see that we're growing ourselves poor. Now, what to do about it? Uh, let's start with what we should not do about it, and that's green growth. At least not green growth understood in a way that we are growing ourselves green automatically. And we do a little bit, and that whole large academic debate uh, is best summarized by the Kuznet curse. As we get rich, we start needing slightly less of it. We can see it for power, we can see it for cement, we can see it for steel, for aluminium, and we can see it for plastic, which is one of my most recent hobbies. Um, but you can just by the eye looking at see that this is not the answer. The peak is just too high, it's too late. Post-peak is by far too flat, uh, the negative slope, uh, and there are too many big countries still on this side of the slope uh, in order to take that trajectory. We need something different. And whilst we can't explain entirely what this new thing could look like, here are at least the pillar, the conceptual pillars that we think need to come in place. And the good thing is one of those pillars starts coming into existence, and that's the left-hand one, abundant clean energy. Who would have thought 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that for the first time uh, a defossilized economy by 2050 is a thinkable future, it's far away, and we all know that, and we know how the INDCs are falling short of our climate commitments. But is it thinkable? For the first time, it is. So in the same way in which we have to decarbonize the energy sector on the left-hand side, well, not decarbonize, but neutralize it uh, with regard to its uh, um, uh, GHG emissions, the same way we have to decarbonize energy, we have to dematerialize and decouple our industry, and that's the right-hand side. And that's where the bioeconomy largely sits. But even that is not good enough. In the, that we need to then to take to build new high-performing systems, mobility systems, housing systems, food systems. And only once we understand that that new mobility platform, for example, actually gives us the prosperity we want, we will start changing our social norm and start to understand that net positive growth might in fact be possible. Uh, we start seeing the duck where formerly we saw the rabbit. Sometimes history ha has it that the right question it ask, is asked. Exactly that happened uh, three years ago, two years ago uh, in Europe. Um, and it had a very technical term. It was called the circular economy package. Um, and there was a debate at the time. So can we afford it in Europe? So, I mean, this adds accelerating ahead of the market towards a circular economy, adds cost to a Euro to European economy that already has a disadvantage when it comes to resource costs. Or is it the other way around that this adds to productivity and uh, then translates into employment and growth? And we had the chance, Ellen MacArthur and I, to put our lock into the fire. And uh, with, uh, uh, at the invitation from Jirki Katain, we were allowed uh, to present present a vision of an economic vision of what circularity actually could mean to the European economy. And we didn't talk about the environment, we didn't talk about resource dependence, and we could have because Europe is the most resource dependent planet, uh, um, uh, continent on the planet. We wanted to talk about structural waste. And um, we took three sectors which are about the most efficient and the most optimized, and McKinsey has been there many times, and still 
as we get more and more efficient on the product level, there is an enormous opportunity on the systems level. Just look at mobility. A car is typically parked 95% of the time. Uh, it has five seats, 1.2 of, the, of them uh, are typically used. 1.2% of the time we're looking for parking space, 1% of the time we sit in congestion. Um, out of eight, uh, the energy we put into it, only 20% makes it to the wheel, and only a thirteenth of that, again, is used to transport us. 50% of our cities actually consist of navigation space, parking lots, etc. Uh, and whilst only during 5% of the day, only um, in rush hour, 10% uh, of the roads is actually utilized. So, we told a similar story for the food sector, where only 5% of the nutrients that we put on the field actually makes it into the human body, not always to our best health, by the way. Uh, or we talked about uh, the building sector, where 54% uh, of our waste, in fact, is construction waste, which is anything between useless and hazardous. Uh, or where even on a Tuesday morning, uh, only 60% of our buildings, or our commercial buildings, are actually utilized. So by all intents and purposes, even in Europe and even in a very advanced economy, uh, we continue to be a very resource-driven, a very resource-heavy economy. And if you look at it all together, uh, an average product in Europe has a lifetime of nine years and afterwards it's gone and it has lost 95% of its value and we accepted that as a social standard to use 95% of the value over the life cycle of a product and during that life cycle, as I just said, it's only 50% utilized. So that's the first point we made. The second point we made is it can be different and that is through disruptive technology. For the first time, this is not a technological dream, it's a societal choice whether we want to go there. And we worked with 200 engineers, we asked them, explain to us what could that mobility system look like? What could that food system, our built environment system look like? Uh, if we pull all the regenerate, share, optimize, loop, virtualize, exchange levers. And they told us it could be 80% cheaper by 2050 or at least 40% cheaper by 2030. Uh, because the mobility system is different altogether. It's not just a supercar, it's integrated, it's autonomous, it's electrified, it's shared very importantly, um, and it's built cradle to cradle. And you can tell a similar system for the food and the, for the build system for, so in other words, there is a technological alternative available. The third point is that we made is we might not get there automatically, simply because um, History teaches us that product innovation travels so much faster than systems innovation, and there is a risk that sort of that we are introducing those new technologies sort of into systems that altogether don't deliver or don't eliminate that structural waste and don't deliver that ecological, societal, and uh, economic advantage. And that's why we need principles. We need a compass, and uh, the principles of the circular economy are in fact providing much of that guidance. Sometimes you get in trouble, but typically it's very strong guidance. It first of all tells you that we need to decouple. It secondly tells you that we need to massively improve utilization once we use. And thirdly, uh, it tells you that we need to uh, avoid any spillovers or negative externalities altogether. And you do that on <clears throat> in by dis differentiating in a way we currently don't between durables and consumables. Durables need to be built in such a way that you can use them over and over again, not just by recycling them, but by reusing, refurbishing, and reconditioning them. And consumables need to be designed in such a way that they can safely re-enter the biosphere. That's the place for the bioeconomy. Now, um, that gives you uh, astonishingly I need some technical support, please. Perhaps you can do that manually. No. Can you jump back, please? Without stealing the thunder. No, can you go back, please? Now, that gives you here we go, back in the floor. Um, astonishingly concrete guidance of how those systems actually need to be designed. And you can distinguish between a world where we just trust in the evolution of technology, that's the gray bar, and a world where you actually apply those rules, those circular regenerative rules. And every single time you find that the 
circular solution is uh, delivering higher societal and also higher economic benefit. Um, and we took this into large uh, uh, general equilibrium modeling and it's, it concluded that in fact this could provide uh, something like 7% extra growth by 2030. That doesn't sound a lot, but that's a half a percentage point of growth every year. And just remember when we in Europe um, two decades ago uh, three decades ago, in fact, 30 years ago, uh, started to discuss the internal market. Uh, that was on the back of a promise of half a percentage extra growth. So if we believe in this, then this is a political and economic project of the same order and magnitude. And what didn't we do to have the internal market at the time? Rightly so, as I think. Now, if this is so interesting, um, we need to understand how to get there. I think we have understood understand it fairly well on what we started calling uh, our uh, butterfly diagram, which is the technosphere side, the durable side, the right-hand side, which is about cars, um, imaging re uh, equipment, iPhones. Um, here it's about uh, <coughs> pulling all the resolve levers and uh, staying short on that one, uh, this is in fact what we see already see happening a lot. We see a lot of investment in regeneration, sharing, optimization, looping, virtualization, exchange. Some of those companies, and many of them I've worked with back in my McKinsey days, um, are amongst the fastest growing. So there is a very strong market-based undercurrent uh, supporting uh, the circular economy on that side. We have more to discuss on the biological side that you all came to Helsinki for today, um, which is the side of the con largely for the consumables. Uh, but here we have a couple of major misconceptions or misperceptions which we need to deal with. Uh, because we call everything that is the, the bioeconomy, we all think automatically it's circular. But biogenet biogenic or bio-based doesn't mean that it automatically fits into the biosphere. So most of the paper, to be straightforward, through inks and through, through additives, in fact, is not reconcilable with the biosphere. And it's losing yield at end of life. Um, Bio-based is not always fit for the technosphere. PLA, for example, is currently not delivering a contribution to more closed loop thinking and to higher recyclability of products. Um, Bio-based that not, does not mean that it's sustainable, and we have seen that in the first generation of, uh, of biofuels. Bio-based does not mean that it's uh, actually creating sufficient lifetime value as it's cascading through the system. Uh, as we see in treated wood, much of it is treated in such a way that it's single use or very low and uh, low value use in the second uh, cascade. And it doesn't, <coughs> and bio-based sometimes is simply not loopable because it's not taking place where most of the nutrients um, uh, accrue. Uh, and that is the cities. So these rules, by sounding a bit theoretical, are very important to remember as we are moving from a bioeconomy, and in a way we have always been living in a bioeconomy, even at a time where we have been exploiting it, towards a circular bioeconomy. And we need to do that because we are facing three very harsh realities in this century. The first is around carbon negativity, the second one is around nutrient availability, and the third one is around material integrity. We have to, until mid-century, create removal capacity for about 10 gigatons of CO2. Otherwise, we are completely off track with regard to our Paris commitments. Um, and the way we are managing the bioeconomy has to consider that. Secondly, nutrient availability. Um, we will have to double by 2050 uh, our food production, and the bioeconomy, again, will have to cater for that. Uh, and thirdly, material integrity, a huge part of the materials that we will be using in the future, uh, in fact, need to be bio-based for all the reasons that we heard. Um, but at the same time, we need to design them for a closed loop system, which currently bio-based materials don't do. Three very quick examples, fun facts. Well, not so fun facts from work that we do uh, at Systemic. The first one is, um, Indonesia, sugar, uh, the, the sugar palm tree, uh, the rebuild project, where out of 150 business cases, we think this is the most exciting bioeconomy business case that we have found, at least in the tropical belt. Uh, 
$7,500 of net present value per hectare. It's able to sequestrate five tons of CO2 a hectare a year. It's creating massive livelihoods and uh, a whole range of products that I won't go through that are economically viable. We don't invest into regeneration today. Not a single uh, euro is currently out of private money invested worldwide into the regeneration and rehabilitation of land. So the bioeconomy needs to close that gap. Second fun, not so fun fact. Um, this is work that we start doing with the Alan MacArthur Foundation. The bioeconomy has to deal with the fact that currently we are losing most of the nutrients that uh, we are entering into the food system. Out of all the 2.8 billion tons that is entering from the land into the city, uh, we are losing some through food waste and all the rest, in fact, then is, uh, is leaving us through human nutrients, which currently are not adding to the bioproductivity of land any anymore. So we, the bioeconomy needs to invest into recoupling. And thirdly, we need to invest into reconciliation. Currently, the bioeconomy is not delivering uh, any contribution to, that helps us to close the loops on any of the materials that we are deriving from it, uh, either by building 100% biodegradability, yeah, and for our standards working in Indonesia, that means it needs to be able to be eaten by a sea turtle or by something that has at least $30 of value a ton so that the waste pickers uh, pick it up. Currently, the bioeconomy doesn't do that yet, but it can. So if we look at the forests in the future, we have to look at it as a part of our ecosystem, and we have to look at it as something as we are building a circular bioeconomy where which forces or which leads us to regener uh, invest into regeneration, into recoupling and into reconciliation. If we do that, the bioeconomy is a big part of that economy we want in the 21st century that allows us that the economy prospers while its natural systems thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stach Tai, for your intervention. Now I give the floor to a colleague and former, Mr. Wallenberg. Please. Yes, now you wonder what that was all about. <laughs> We're actually both farmers, the chairman and I, and, uh, and uh, we are very interested in the bioeconomy in the farming sector. Anyway, I stand before you. Good morning, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. And allow me to start off by congratulating Finland on its 100 year anniversary. Sweden and Finland is very, very close, uh, has been for a long time, and I hope will grow even closer as time goes by. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you from a different perspective. I'm Swedish. I um, uh, will take a Swedish perspective to a certain extent uh, about the words I'm saying. I'm also coming to you uh, from a perspective of looking at the bioeconomy from dif different aspects. Uh, my, uh, the bank I am chairman of uh, launched the first green bond 10 years ago, together with the World Bank. I'm uh, working with a company like uh, AstraZeneca, which is, for, of course, a pharmaceutical, but uh, very much uh, expanding into the biomedicine um, and the biotech sphere. And actually, you will see that uh, some of the techniques that uh, pharmaceuticals and biotech companies are working with uh, in the future and today is also applied in the forest sector. So we're seeing this cross-reference uh, on, uh, on the different side. I've also been working with Stora Enso uh, for a number of years and, and I follow research very much. I come into this discussion from a different uh, perspective, uh, from different perspectives. I guess I'm supposed to push that one, yeah. So I'm not going to spend time on this picture because uh, the previous speakers have of course spoken about the changes that we are all facing and we now have to deal with. So I'll, 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 I'll spend my uh, few minutes today on more on the forest sector and the pulp and paper side. And uh, as we all know, for 
the countries, Sweden and for Finland also, the uh, forest sector and the pulp and paper sector is of immense value for many, many different reasons. Uh, and I think it will continue to be, and I'll try to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about that uh, and, and how, how this can be important. I also think it's important to put this in the perspective that um, there is a revolution going on on the science side in the sense that uh, basic research is, of course, very important, but the speed of science and the speed of technology is moving it into applied science much faster than it did before. So therefore, it's of immense value going forward. Um, why is this important? Well, you just look into Europe, and you will find on this map how incredibly important the forest sector is in terms of growth uh, compared to the rest of Europe. And uh, for those of you who don't live in Europe, uh, I, I can tell you that, uh, for example, Sweden has 70% of its land mass covered by forest. Uh, and uh, it's not always easy when you are two countries so dependent on this natural resource to make our voices heard to the extent we perhaps would like to in Brussels, because this is, of course, very important for our part and the way we manage our economies and our resources, which is not always the case for other parts uh, of Europe. But I think we're going in the right direction also here. So in, in Sweden, I would say that uh, there has been a tremendously long and very important uh, movement towards uh, sustainable forest management. Um, it's, Sweden is the third largest exporter of pulp. It's an export value of about 13 billion. And 30, 000, uh, 70 thousand employees about, and, and 30 thousand external employees are actually employed in one way or another into this sector. And why is it so important? It's sustainable and we can actually use it many times. And, and our chairman discussed the importance in economic terms um, of, of this sector. And uh, we usually talk about the green gold in Sweden, uh, which you can see uh, on this picture here, uh, how tremendously important in terms of net export uh, revenue this sector is for both, uh, not only for Canada, but of course also for Sweden and Finland who has a tremendous uh, amount of earnings coming this way. And in, the, and, and in the graph to the right in this picture, you can actually see that, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry about that there, there, this is in Swedish, but you can actually see that in terms of net revenue, the green bar in terms of net export revenue, uh, the forest um, industry sector in Sweden is by far the most uh, net income generator of all the big export uh, sectors uh, in our part of the world. A value in 2016 of about 125 billion Swedish crowns and accounting for something, some, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of our employment. Uh, and therefore, that's the reason why we call it um, the green gold. Our focus uh, and during the time that I've been working uh, in, in this uh, sector, a long time uh, was devoted to improve the productivity uh, in this sector in rather small incremental steps. Um, very little was actually thought about spending, uh, in, oh, I would say not enough time was being spent on R&D, product development, uh, and taking big leaps. And uh, this, I think, uh, has been a, a very difficult thing. I, I would say that, um, to a certain extent, this industry for a long time behaved like a real commodity player, uh, with little differentiation between the producers. This is, of course, uh, perhaps a little bit hard to say for those working in this sector. But I, I still believe that when we look back, uh, that was unfortunately the situation. And as an investor, it might be good to take a look at this picture. Um, this is really uh, 
showing that for a long, long time, for a number of years, being an investor in, this, uh, in the pulp and paper sector was really a desert walk. We're now, uh, we're now getting closer between the general stock market and uh, the, the pulp and paper sector. But uh, you have to have a very long-term view from uh, the sh millennium shift until a couple of years back to think that uh, this is a very interesting sector to be. Not only because perhaps what I said before of, of doing small productivity steps, but also because of the dramatic uh, changes in the structure of the market. Digitization took away the use of printing paper, newsprint uh, printing paper, uh, this, some very, very fast development of the technology around the eucalyptus tree, which made it much more productive to produce uh, forests in, in the southern part of the hemisphere than up here. So, you know, for, for a while, I think even it was more, more, more profitable to import a ton of pulp from Brazil than actually growing it uh, and, and producing it in our part of the world. Then, why are we then staying uh, in this? Why do we think that this is so important? Uh, let me show you a film, and uh, it might give you some insight to why this could be very interesting in the future. Have you ever thought about what a tree can do for the way we live? The environment, the planet. Too much of what we consume today is made from non-renewable materials. We can recycle some of them a few times, but we can't renew them. These materials contribute to global warming, threatening growth, prosperity, and our everyday lives. And consumers all over the world are demanding change. They want solutions that will help them take better care of the planet. Now, imagine that everything you bought came from material that is not only recyclable, but renewable. Regrown year after year, where the only gas that's emitted is pure, breathable oxygen, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere instead of releasing it. Trees. We've been using them for ages. They keep us informed. They keep us warm. They keep us protected. And over time, we've innovated and made new discoveries. Trees. Today, we can break the fibers down into tiny, tiny microfibrils and separate the components of wood. Tomorrow, we'll be rebuilding them into new materials, like strong and light carbon fibers that in turn can be turned into cars, planes, windmills, We'll even be replacing oil-based plastic bottles. Now, you might think that a plastic bottle is not a big deal, but you could build a tower to the moon with all the plastic bottles used in just one year. 25 times over. More people living in cities means more of those bottles. It means more food packages. It means more housing. Think about making all of these things with renewable materials. But not only that, we can make materials intelligent. Packages that tell us where they've been, where they are, what's inside, and if it's fresh. Soon, we'll see a range of new inventions pop up from all sorts of places. Transparent wood. Programmable wood that can change shape or form depending on the needs. Paper that can store energy and solar panels from trees. Trees can slow down global warming, but in order to do that, we have to take care of them, grow more than we harvest, and get the most from every fiber in every one. Have you ever thought about what a tree can do? We do.
all the time. Store Enso, the renewable materials company. So I'm sorry about this corporate uh, kind of uh, advertisement, but I, I thought I thought I would show it to you because I think it tells you a little bit uh, about what is trying, what the aim is. Uh, and if you look at this uh, this uh, chart here, you can see that the desert walk that I alluded to earlier actually has been uh, is, is taking place as we speak, uh, both in terms of sales and uh, income. Uh, to this company over uh, the years, we have moved uh, substantially uh, into new types of, of businesses that I would say low, lie closer to the bioeconomy. But I also like to talk about forest-related research because I think this is one of the key aspects to what we uh, are looking at going forward. Number one, I think even though 400 million euro in Sweden may sound like a big um, a sum of money, I, I still think it's uh, too low when you look at the possibilities on what we can do. And we probably have to see more cooperation going on uh, between both public and private actors uh, doing this. In uh, our family, uh, we work with foundations and spend uh, substantially sums of money uh, on uh, research, and we have been supporting forest uh, and uh, and uh, fiber research uh, for a number of years. Um, we've done it for about 10 years, and we're going to continue to do it for another 10 years. And it will focus uh, for the next 10-year period on biology, chemistry and chemicals, and nanoscience, uh, where you saw all of these components uh, being shown uh, in the, in the um, uh, film that I just showed. And this will be done in, in the Swedish context uh, at different uh, places in, in, in Sweden with different universities. We believe very strongly in the cooperation between uh, different universities to use the knowledge not only in the traditional sciences but also in those sciences that are being developed uh, at this point in time. So the focus now going forward will be twofold, first in new materials, uh, looking into the, uh, uh, the whole thinking about uh, composites that you saw in the film, building material. Today you, will, you can already see uh, in Stockholm high rises being built out of wood instead of concrete and, and steel. Uh, you will also see uh, a deep in, working into nanotechnology in order to get chemicals. We look into the possibility, uh, hopefully also with our friends here in Finland, around the possibility of, you, of, 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 of reducing the need for this non-sustainable cotton production, and hopefully we can turn wood fibers into clothes going forward. And the second uh, thought uh, that we spent a lot of focus on is to accelerate uh, tree breeding. Uh, if you think about the uh, Bahia in, in Brazil, um, you will see, you can basically stand and hold on to the tree, and you can see the tree growing. It's seven to ten times faster uh, tree production uh, than in our part of the world. I think just by doing uh, substantially more uh, re research and development in this field will actually accelerate the possibility of increasing uh, the, the biomass. So we do need to spend more emphasis and more uh, substantially more resources uh, in this field. Uh, you can see here uh, the possibility of using completely new ideas uh, on and new uh, technologies to help uh, the bioforestry uh, research to take uh, great advances. Uh, you know, the accelerator programs that usually only was used in physics is clearly an, a possibility of opening up to other forms of science, not least in the, in the fiber. Uh, you also see it in the pharmaceutical. And here we have a great, uh, as an example, a great possibility to think about this. But I can't uh, resist, ladies and gentlemen, 
since I'm here um, to push for the Swedish-Finnish link can be made substantially stronger. Uh, we're doing a lot, but we should do much more together. And finally, I'd just like to point out uh, a motto that my family has when my, uh, this is my grandfather and his brother, and they were gonna sell out of trains um, to move into uh, airlines. So it, one brother wrote to the other, to go from the old to what is about to come is the only tradition worth keeping. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallenberg. And now I give the floor to another colleague, the former Prime Minister of Finland, Esko Aho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I have to uh, say that Finland, as Mr. Chairman was saying in his opening remarks, Finland has grown with bioeconomy. And when we became independent in 1917, we were one of the poorest countries among, uh, in, the, in, the, in the industrialized world. And uh, during the last century, there are four countries which were growing fastest. Norway, Singapore, Japan, and Finland. And Finland is the only one of those four that was growing more or less based on its forest industry and the ecosystem around that. I think that is a good foundation also to think about the future. So we have been able to show that it works. This model, model works. Um, I'm interested in execution, like Mr. Chairman was uh, as well. So we have a lot of good ideas, but how to move to execution as fast as, as possible. Uh, I always remember I was prime minister in the 1990s, and my colleague in, in Russia was uh, 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 Viktor Chernomyrdin, and his famous saying uh, is uh, telling how difficult it is, not only in Russia, but in many other countries as well, to get things to be done. And his, uh, his uh, phrase is very famous. I quote him. He said, we tried our best, and you know the rest. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, uh, we have been discussing these topics how many years? 10, 15, 20, 20 years. But, but the progress we have achieved is not what we want to have. Um, how, to, how to move on? I, I, I found uh, 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 a good strategy which was originally designed for uh, uh, military pilots during the Korean War. It's called Oda Loop. Oda uh, means O O D A. First O, observe. Second O, orient. Third uh, letter D, decide. And finally, A, act. And I think we need more or less that. Or maybe, actually, we should move to 3D strategy. 3Ds means, in my opinion, in this bioeconomy uh, vocabulary, it means deduct, decide, and deliver. Because what we have to do is not to create vision or ideas what to do in the future, but deduct how technologies, revolutionary technologies, how they can be taken into the use in the most efficient way, rapidly, efficiently, in a way that consumers are getting maximum benefit from that as well. And history is telling that that has been possible. If you look at the history of railways, or history of cars, history of electricity, or history of uh, mobile phones, you will recognize that this type of conceptual approach has worked. We have to look back, especially this uh, mobile phone case, uh, also because of the fact that Finland and Sweden were leading countries in that as well. 
Was it a poor coincidence that that mobile revolution was led by Nordic companies uh, and Europe, generally, late 1980s and 1990s? We were lucky, probably we were a bit lucky, but we were able to create the best ecosystem for mobile technology to grow. The best place to develop these technologies in late 1980s and especially 1990s, the best place to do that was here in Europe. And if you look back, what were the ingredients of that? It's easy to recognize that there were certain, certain key elements. Long-term R&D investments in radio technology especially uh, Nordic countries and Finland especially was uh, was performing very very well Be thanks to long-term public and private investments in that sector secondly we were able to to make a standard uh, Mr. Wallenberg was speaking about Finland and Sweden uh, and our collaboration NMT was a good example how we were leading the technological change Nordic mobile technology application or, or standard was very critical to get business to grow rapidly. And then we moved to European, pan-European standard, uh, 1987, when, when GSM standard was adopted in Copenhagen. That standard created foundation for Europe to become leading region in the world in this sector. And then others had to follow. Europe took that first, and then others had to follow. It became a global standard. Then, access to the market. It's not poor coincidence that expansion of te mobile technologies took place sim in the same time when the European Single Market Act was not only adopted, but very well executed as well, by the end of 1990-92. Uh, that opened the market for all actors, and the most efficient ones, most competitive ones, like Nokia and Ericsson, were able to ben take benefit from, from that. Uh, fourth uh, factor was that we, we had risk-taking capacity. We were able to take, take risks. And finally, we had consumers who were active to take into the use new, new products. So if we take this example and this concept I think it was concept. Conceptual thinking was the foundation of this success story of Europe and, and Nordic countries. How to repeat that? How to, what kind of concept we should take in order to get, let's say, decisions to be made and especially delivery to be, to be, to be efficient, efficient one? I think it's about ecosystem, like it is mentioned here several times. For the first, I, I have ten, 10 points on my list. For the first, strong R&D investments. And I wonder why Finland and Sweden cannot do much, much more together. Why to do separately the same things? I think we have to make a division of labor. In Europe, we have to get more funding for, for bioeconomy investments. Secondly, we need uh, new skills and, and talents. Um, bioeconomy is very complicated because traditional forestry and forestry, uh, forestry industry capacities and talents are not enough. We have discussed with uh, Mark uh, uh, Palaki uh, that we need uh, bioeconomy master, master degree program in Europe. Rapidly, not next uh, decade, but rapidly, immediately. And again, I think that Europe and, and Nordic countries could take a lead in, in that. That means that we can combine different disciplines together because in order to get bioeconomy to work, it's not enough that we have good capacities in, in traditional forestry sectors, but we have to be able to integrate management skills, new type of management skills, business skills, consumer uh, orientation into, into that as well. For the third, we need regulation in this sector as well. New products have to be able to come to the market rapidly. And uh, in order to get that, we need regulation. It's very difficult to understand how, 
how difficult it is to move from oil-based products into bio-based ones. We were just looking at these cups in, 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 uh, which are waiting for you when you are going to take coffee. These cups are plastics, made from plastics. Mark, why? <laughs> we, should, we should show the way how to move rapidly also, also from, from traditional products into new ones. And we need regulatory efforts. We need regulatory efforts to do that. Regulation is not a bad thing as long as it's smart. Smart regulation can promote change, not prohibit change. For the fourth, I think we need similar approach like we have tried to do in, the, in, in Europe with digital technologies. We have been speaking about digital single market in Europe. We need digital bio market in Europe. Concrete efforts to get Europe a one single market for bio economy. For the fifth, we need public procurement policies. Uh, less, a bit less than 20%, maybe 16, 17% of our GDP in Europe is uh, uh, coming from, from, from the public sector, public sector procurement. How that money is spent? Is it spent for traditional economy, economic, uh, traditional economies or for bioeconomy? It really matters. Um, for the sixth, we need risk-taking capacity. Uh, we have slush here in Helsinki uh, last uh, week. Yeah, last week we had 20,000 20, startup company people, investors uh, here in Helsinki. Uh, it's an amazing event. How to get similar things to happen around bioeconomy? It's a good question, because bioeconomy can be as exciting as digital economy in today's world. For the seventh, uh, we need new governmental decision-making system. Who is taking responsibility? For example, in Finland, if you look at bioeconomy challenges, we have Ministry for Agriculture and Forestry, we have Ministry for Education, we have Ministry for uh, economy and employment, all are responsible, but no one is responsible. That is a fact. When you have these silos, it's so difficult to get things to be integrated into one. That's why I think we have to break these silos and to have new type of governmental system as well. Uh, the eighth point, consumer orientation. Without consumers, strong commitment, we cannot get results. I think um, um, in Singapore they have a very good illustration what is needed. They say, and this is ninth point, they need, we need public-private people collaboration. Not public-private partnership, but PPP means public, private and people. And when consumers are integrated into that uh, collaboration, I believe that the results will be much more efficient. And finally, the tenth point. What is the major uh, ingredient lacking both in business and government side? Lack of patience. Politicians are looking at the next elections. But if you want to get things to be done, that's, that's not the right call. You have to have a long-term commitment and patience to, to look forward over the next elections. But the same in business as well. Quarterly results, annual results. If you look at only these, these short-term objectives, how come we can get real changes to take, take place? We need patience in decision-making. Decision with these uh, 10 ingredients, 10 points, uh, I think that we can, we can really get things to, to, to happen. And now it's time really to move from discussion to decision making and execution. Thank you. Thank you, Esku. And now it is possible for all of you to put questions to the panel. And uh, Etne and her colleagues will have micros uh, available for those who want 
to take the floor. Anyone who wants to start? I have one right here for us. Okay. You're on. Sir, please let us have your name and your company as well. Thank you. My name is Morris Ryan. I'm from uh, Greenbelt Limited, a private forestry company in Ireland. Um, one of the challenges we see for improving forestry cover um, across Ireland, um, and looking at that on a micro scale, is the lack of partnership and communication and collaboration between all elements of the agri-sector. And I was looking for your opinion on how that could be improved and how you can convince the rest of the agricultural sector that forestry is at least as important as the, uh, as the rest of it. How to involve the agriculture sector? Yeah. Okay, an important question. Thank you. Who wants to start to say something about that? Start time. Mm. I think there is a, a growing, uh, we, we need to grow a perception that this is simply a big part of the uh, economy. I haven't worked uh, on forestry programs in the north. Um, I'm working a lot on forestry programs in the tropical belt, uh, which um, uh, is a very interesting one from a number of perspectives because uh, that's where we think the single biggest uh, CO2 uh, sink that uh, sits that we have available over the next uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, everything else won't be fast enough. Uh, and it's uh, where uh, there is the fastest growing um, market for feedstock. Uh, and it's where uh, most employment continues to sit in rural systems. Um, and um, it's in fact quite striking how currently uh, capital flows are uh, avoiding those sectors. Uh, and uh, it's also, when you do that work, quite striking uh, how difficult it is to get uh, good investment conditions in place. Um, as you say, this is a, 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 is a team sport where you need to have, um, where, you, where you need to build all the supply chains for whatever it is that you produce, where you need to have um, government supporting it. Um, and the single biggest problem that you run into the, tr uh, into the tropical belt is in fact property rights, uh, something that you probably don't have in Ireland, but uh, where, uh, how can you uh, in fact and ensure that people start investing into um, uh, the agroforestry sector simply because um, uh, no one has uh, a property assur uh, uh, assurance that has enough runway for you to invest. Um, but uh, for that and for other uh, elements, um, there are some really good answers coming out of the technology sector. So um, we've started to run a program introducing blockchain uh, in order to safeguard property rights for smallholder farmers, uh, which sounded very uh, fantastic uh, five years ago, which is a reality now, uh, and which is a complete uh, a game changer. Uh, something else you can do is how can you actually spread agricultural practices uh, to those who need to understand how ecological farming could actually look like, or how reforestation can actually happen. Again, this is something that can now easily be sp uh, spread uh, um, uh, due to uh, technology, to apps, uh, and to the, the better connectivity of the farming community. Um, then uh, there is something around market access. Uh, then there is uh, something around uh, creating um, uh, market information in the tropical belt. There's, you need to know a lot around uh, about what's happening under the canopy. You need to know a lot uh, how is the forest, uh, the forest line, is it really stable? Uh, and so um, there is a whole um, menu of technology options becoming now available uh, to build those uh, uh, new markets around uh, um, agro, the agroforestry sector. Um, and all of that is team sports and all of that is about bringing partners together that traditionally haven't worked uh, together in a supply chain. Thank you, Professor Stoktai. Very important question. And um, as I said in my introduction, we have, of course, with our situation in this part of Europe, a focus upon the forest sector, but uh, globally, it is also about agriculture, of course. And if we don't understand each other, it will end up in political problems with regulations, 
of different kind. We can see that discussion already inside the European Union. Next question. Yes, short. Uh, very, very short comment. I, I think there is one area where there is a common interest as well. There is going to be a lot of uh, digital technology infrastructure investments to be made in the, in the future. And uh, I can imagine that uh, agriculture and forestry do have a common interest that uh, these investments will be made in a way that they will reach uh, those regions where agriculture and forestry are critical, critical parts of the economy. Yeah. Okay. Over here. Henrik and Root, please. Thank you for the introduction. Um, um, I fully uh, agree with some of the panelists that uh, R&D cooperation within uh, the Nordics is is needed, and more is needed. Uh, we. In the Nordic uh, scene, we would form a sort of a Silicon Valley of bioeconomy if more cooperation would uh, be possible. What are the obstacles for this development? Thank you, sir. Professor Stuck, It's one aspect. Uh, amongst many, of course, um, is we, we need to um, find ways to assemble the supply chains of the future versus the supply chains of the past. Um, I had the privilege to work for the last three years for um, an initiative which is called uh, the New Plastic Economy, which is the attempt to completely redefine how uh, the plastic sector has to look like in order to uh, be a closed loop economy. Uh, uh, in order to uh, ensure that much more of the value is recovered, to ensure that much less is leaking into the environment, uh, which is uh, uh, very dr increasingly dramatic and graphic, uh, graphic right now, and where m uh, much less of the material actually is taken from primary uh, or finite resources. Um, and uh, it's one experience out of many which told me, uh, which taught us uh, how. Um, uh, those new uh, actors, um, uh, in fact, have never really come together as a supply chain, and sort of you have all the uh, the unlikely suspects coming together. There's of course the raisin producers, there's the refineries, there's uh, the the packagers, there's the packaging, uh, the, the converters, uh, but then there is also the environmental services companies. Then there is uh, uh, there are uh, there are the IT companies. There are uh, there uh, is a lot of uh, technology companies that sort of never have been part of what you would call a traditional packaging supply chain. So one part of the trick is actually to bring new partners together and you can sort of tell a similar story for almost every uh, one of the transitions that we'll go through uh, as an economy in the next 20 years about uh, the uh, energy arena, around the mobility arena, around the consumer goods arena, around the consumer electronics arena. Every time those solutions will look so differently, I mean just look at mobility, it's not about car makers talking to each other what the next car would look like. It's a completely different game where energy needs to be part of it, where IT needs to be part of it, where infrastructure planning needs to be part of it. And so I think uh, thinking through who is the bioeconomy really uh, uh, it, it might in fact be one element out of many. Dr. Waldenberg. So um, I, I, I believe there are many aspects to this question which could be improved in our part uh, of the world. I mean, we have a natural scene to do it. We have a long-term connection. We should probably be much more focused in um, developing uh, cross-fertilization and, and cooperation in joint uh, research projects in, in this field. But to make it really grow and to make it expand into its full potential, I think we have to add uh, you know, an ecosystem which also includes risk capital to get the entrepreneurs going. Uh, th this has to be supported by local uh, traditional industry. It has to open up like we see in the digital economy uh, where, where, and also in the, in the biotech side, uh, where large companies open up for cooperation uh, and, and developing new businesses in conjunction uh, with new technologies being opened up. And for that, you need risk capital. As we know, 
looked at the uh, return on investment in the past, uh, it's not been very uh, interesting and therefore I do think we need to find uh, also the economic incentives to uh, take uh, risk and go into this kind of economy. We have the chance to put one more question. I think we try to do that. Yes, we'll, but maybe, short. we'll maybe give you two because you started a little late. So I'll give you an extra five minutes. Okay, okay. So we'll I, get a few of them in for you. I, Very short quick Tesco. questions. I, I like this idea of, uh, of Silicon Valley of bioeconomy because, again, it's a conceptual approach. We have to understand that, for example, uh, venture funding has to be included. Uh, if you look at what happened in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, in 1990s, 2000s. I, I think that that is, that is something we have to carefully look at. Secondly, I, I think funding, funding is critical. Funding systems are, even, uh, uh, even in countries, inside the countries, leading to isolation and, and uh, not promoting uh, collaboration. And I, I think we have to change these funding systems and governments are in a key role in, in that. Okay. A few uh, quick ones, yeah, and uh, quick uh, answers. If no, I can take this lady, we promised yes, her. Uh, and don't have to make uh, out your yes. Okay. yes, thank you. I'm Henna Virkunen, a member of European Parliament from Finland, and I'd like to thank all the speakers for your inspiring speeches. Uh, I have to say, like a chairman just said, that in the European level we are often facing challenges with bioeconomy because I think that it's often just understood as a bioenergy. So I think many of the decision makers, in, for example, in European level, in European Parliament, they don't know what the wood can do, for example. They think that we just want to use bioenergy. So how you see what would be the best way to promote all the possibilities with bioeconomy? Because we know that it, it could be a solution for many, many global challenges what we are facing but I think that there is lack of knowledge also among the decision makers still I think we take one more question excuse me sir and we can combine there. them yes, all yes. so sorry sir okay Ari Laine Uusimaa Regional Council Helsinki Uusimaa Regional Council from Finland and uh, there is a has been a lot of going on during this year in Finland and I guess in Sweden too, concerning the, like Henna said, bioenergy, biofuels questions. We have Chinese investment money just, to, just about getting in or not. And the European Commission and etc. is, is uh, thinking a lot of that. What is your opinion of the situation right now? Mm -hmm. Two questions. Who wants to start? Can um, Professor? Maybe I could just emphasize uh, again that when you talk about the bioeconomy, um, a lot of the discussion has been about products. Uh, but I think um, the services coming from from forests and other um, natural ecosystems are are even more important um, in in many ways. Uh, so I think I think one thing we have to do is emphasize that. Things like carbon sequestration and, cli and climate control and water water supply, these things that are not marketed, um, are, are really have a, um, a higher social value in many cases than than the things that are. So getting that that balance and recognizing uh, those the services from uh, from from uh, from forests and other ecosystems, I think is really critical going forward. I think everyone will accept that any of the visions that any one of us has talked about today uh, are impossible um, without uh, the bioeconomy. Uh, at the same time, there is a reservation about what this uh, bioeconomy can actually deliver. Uh, and there might be a bit of a rebranding challenge here simply because the first generation of the bioeconomy did not keep its promises or uh, it created questions and uh, challenges um, that at least at the time were unforeseen. Um, I had that experience over the last year where we were working with the government 
government of Malaysia trying to make them sort of almost a Saudi Arabia of, uh, of the bioeconomy uh, because there is so much degraded land that can be converted into uh, a source of, uh, uh, of biomass uh, which can then drive both their, uh, their energy and their productive sector. Um, and uh, that led into very interesting discussions sort of to what extent that actually uh, uh, is compatible with uh, the, uh, the primary forest line, to what extent um, uh, that is actually a land grab over social entitlements that exist on that land, to what extent that is sort of really uh, 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 supporting the carbon agenda, the, the, uh, the, the climate agenda. Um, and it's now that the whole program is set up in such a way that there is a charter where we also brought in um, uh, an, an NGO called uh, the Nature Conservancy, that everyone agreed sort of what it is uh, that the bioeconomy should do in that country and what are the principles, what, are the, what is the charter along it will be developed that it will in fact tick all of the boxes uh, from uh, economic to ecological to social. Um, everyone sort of starts seeing it as a major opportunity but that was uphill because there was um, uh, an unclear perception about what the bioeconomy actually could do and that has a lot to do with the early years of it. And so I think uh, um, being able as an industry itself to describe sort of what those principles are in the, what, uh, in a, according to which the industry wants to develop and uh, which there are then supportive of this SDG or whatever decoupling agenda, whatever language we are, we are using. I think that's very important um, uh, to, to, to show uh, to what extent it can tick all of these uh, boxes if it's done well. Dr. Wadenbay and then finally Esko Aho. So I, I think one thing we should uh, think about um, in, in, in discussing the bioeconomy is that I feel there is a tendency that there is either economic growth or uh, getting into a more sustainable world. I happen to be of a different view. I think that the ability for uh, companies and society to make uh, a profitable future uh, also gives the opportunity for new technological uh, development to be funded. And, and uh, the uh, enormous uh, need for green infrastructure, green investments in this world uh, would in itself be a tremendous possibility for economic growth, uh, sustainable economic growth uh, in the future. I believe that that is perhaps the most important message to try to uh, spread around the world. Because today, it's either the movement looking at trying to get the better sustainable and better world, or those who are trying to push economic growth. I actually believe you can do it together. Esko. Uh, first about the Chinese interest. Uh, China has patience. They always have long-term plan and they have patience. And when, if and when China is interested in long fiber, I think it's a good indication that, that that biomass will have bright future. And we have to, we have to take that seriously as well uh, to, to show that we can compete with them. Secondly, about European, European challenges. Do you think that uh, forest industry and forest sector in Europe has been playing defense or offense? In my opinion, they have played defense all the time trying to say, we are not that bad, as you say. We are better than you expect. I think it's time to move from defense to offense and to show that really you can reach both. You can get economic growth, you can get sustainability, you can get jobs, you can get better future for, for all. This is win-win, a real win-win opportunity. But you have to play offense if you want to succeed. And I think that that is the major challenge. And we have seen now in Europe that, that, that uh, it's, it's not very easy to change this, mi this mindset. Yes, I think you are perfectly right, Esko. And uh, it's a very important question. Because uh, we are convinced that this is the future. But uh, to be honest, we haven't even been able to convince our own population about this. Uh, not least than to say the rest of the European population and electorate. So when we are talking about bioeconomy, still for the majority it is about bioenergy. And we need to take a step forward. 
And the film presented by Dr. Wallenberg, for instance, is a good example how you can do it. More of that. Otherwise, we end up in the trap. Everyone wants to have more wood products, but not to cut any trees. And uh, there you are in many countries, and we must be aware of this, and we must uh, address this conflict, otherwise it ends up in a situation where we feel that we are, if not betrayed, so at least stopped in our ambitions to build something new. A very good first panel, I must say. A heartfelt thanks to those who did this first part of the summit, a scientific and political interesting part of a picture about what is possible to achieve in the future. And now they, and also you, deserve a coffee break. Thank you. Indeed, many thanks to our great panel there for getting off today's summit. Uh, very, very interesting there, information from you all. And a big thanks to your end to you as well for moderating this session. We have a quick coffee break, dear friends. 11.30 sharp, we start back here. So please, we will be starting, continuing this discussion, you know, the bioeconomy paradigm, but really, really looking into the opportunities as well as the challenges. So enjoy your coffee break. Do take a visit to some of the exhibitors and um, say hello and see what's going on there. Check out some of the products that are there. But please, please, please be back on time, 11.30. Thanks again. Thank you.